And in days like this, to know that the God of heaven is the good God, the great God, and our Savior. These things I pray in his most precious name. Amen. You may be seated. I attend to just a couple of announcements here. As I prayed, there are services coming up next week beginning on Sunday and going through Wednesday uh, with the Randy Merrill Evangelistic Team. They will be with us both services Sunday morning. They will live stream with us Sunday night. We will run Sunday as we've been doing most of the summer. Monday, however, we are, weather permitting, setting up to have a picnic on the grounds. Around 12 to 1 o'clock, if you'd come, bring your picnic basket and have on Labor Day a picnic here coming to an end at 3 o'clock. At 3 o'clock, we're going to have a sacred concert with the Randy Merrill Evangelistic Team. I, I don't know if there's four or six traveling in this group. Uh, they're all also very musical. And at 3 o'clock, Labor Day, uh, we will have a special service. If the weather is fit, this will all be outside. If the weather's not fit, we will probably take a rain check on the picnic, but still have the 3 o'clock sacred concert. Then on Tuesday and Wednesday, we will have our 7 o'clock service. 7 on Tuesday, 7 on Wednesday. Uh, sort of along the lines of how our special services regularly run. So Sunday through Wednesday. Sunday running like this one does. The 9.30 service, the 11 o'clock service, a 6 o'clock live stream. Monday, Labor Day, picnic if the weather is Okay, but the 3 o'clock sacred concert. Tuesday, 7 o'clock. Wednesday, 7 o'clock. All right. Now, as you've heard during the pandemic, everything is subject to change. <laughs> so be much in prayer and in consideration of these days. If you can, put us on your calendar. If you can't, put us on your calendar and pray for us. Uh, we, were, we are aware that Labor Day is a, a day of, of the last of summer in many minds, and people already got great plans and escapes in mind. But if not, here's your plan. Come here. Enjoy the services. Enjoy this team. I don't believe anybody in this room has ever heard uh, the Randy Merrill evangelistic team. Um, but I can tell you of a surety that it's going to be along the lines of Mike Schrock with five or six more instruments. So um, I trust that you're praying and in much prayer about this. Well, having said that, I've used up all my time for announcements. Let's move along. 453, he keeps me singing. We're going to sing the first, the second, the third verse, and then I'll ask you to stand on verse number five. 453, remain seated on the first three verses, and then we'll stand on the the last.
normally greeted each other, but you know, the pandemic has made this um, kind of a, maybe a dangerous thing even. So if you would just wave at somebody before you're sitting down, just let them know you said hello. And after that, you can sit down. <laughs> Tori, if you'd please come and get ready to bless us with song. not given us the spirit of fear, but has given us the strength to obey. With power and sound mind, with love the unfailing kind, oh, be not ashamed of his way. May his word be our banner held high. May the Lord find us faithful every day. Seeketh after things of this life is a soldier who passes the test. Be faithful, be working, be running, be serving, be searching his word for his last. May the Lord find us faithful. May his word be our banner held high. May the Lord find us faithful every day, though we live, though we die. Living or dying, may wretched life you loved and forgave. A life that is on fire, be only our heart's desire. Be faithful from now to the grave. May the Lord find us faithful. May his word be our banner held high. May the Lord find us faithful every day, though we live, though we die. May the Lord find us faithful every day, Thank you for that this morning, Tori. And I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 17. And as you turn there, I will let you to know that that's not our text. That's the uh, verses that I want to use as the introduction uh, for the message this morning. Uh, so I'd like to uh, share a story. You're in number 17. And I'm going to share a story with you, and then it'll set up the reading of this. When I was young, I was one of those kind of fellows who was too big for his britches. Have you ever heard that expression? Is that a, is that a term that's ever used anymore? Too big for his britches. I thought I was somebody. At least I mouthed off like I was. I was. And so uh, one day my dad, and maybe some of you who knew him had this happen to you as well. He gave me the important test. Anybody here take the important? How many will confess that they take, took the important test? I took the important test. And this is, this is true. 
You can do it at your own house. If you have someone who thinks they're important, this is how this works. You take a cup of water and you put it on the table, and then you ask the person who thinks they're important to put their finger or their thumb in the water. When they pull their finger or their thumb out, if a hole is where their finger or thumb was, they're important. <laughs> I did take it. I, th I actually thought I could leave a, at least a dent. <laughs> I quickly found out I, I wasn't important. Now, my dad built upon that, and there was a lot of elaboration that went into that. But this is, this is something that is not just unique to my own personal life. Some of you sat there very innocent, like very holy, as, as if you've never needed to get your comeuppance in relationship to your own pride and arrogancy. But, you know, I was hopeful on that day I took the test that God would do something and I would get to prove, yes, I am important. God said. Well, you know, in number 17, there's a, there's a story about where God said someone was important. Now, the test wasn't a cup of water. It was actually even more impressive. And I'll begin reading in, in verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take of every one of them a rod, according to the house of their fathers, of all their princes, according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods. Write thou every man's name upon his rod. In chapter 16, there had been a, a rebellion uh, a civil war, really, and the complaint was, Moses is too much in charge. We don't think we need Moses anymore. We're sick and tired of Moses and every decision he makes. We're big enough to run our own uh, uh, ideas, and we don't need his help, and we don't want anything to do with him anymore, and we're sick of it. We're tired of it. All he does is mouth off and make rules, and we're, we're done. We're done. And Moses went to God and said, now you know I'm only out here in the wilderness because you made me come with them. This was not my idea. And, and now I've got all these people complaining. I don't know what to tell you. And God said, okay. And he got in on the problem and he solved it. And when the dust settled, and my message isn't about how God settled. He, he, it was no doubt what he did. He took care of it. But when the dust settled... He said to Moses, I'm, I'm not going to have more problems. I am going to tell everyone who's important. And that's it. No more murmuring. No more complaining. This is it. And this is how we're going to do it. I want from the 12 tribes of Israel, the chief man, the captain of the tribe. If you belong to the tribe of Issachar, there was a man who you talked to. And he talked to Moses. It was very organized. If you lived in the tribe of Dan or Asher or Naphtali or Judah, there was a man, a top man. That man was supposed to bring a staff that he owned. It was a symbol of his office and probably also his walking stick. He was supposed to bring it and carve into it his name. In verse number three, God said, now from the tribe of Levi, I want Aaron's rod. Aaron would be the high priest, Moses' brother said, I, I want his rod. And you're going to lay them inside the tabernacle overnight. Now, I'm, I'm skipping down another verse. I'm not quoting it. I am just summarizing quickly here because this is still my introduction. And in the morning, whose ever rod, walking stick, has bud on it, that person's important. Now, you might have a a, a wooden staff at your house, a, a walking stick. Maybe you bought one on vacation. Maybe your grandfather made it. Maybe someone carved it for you and you were fascinated and purchased it. Maybe you have an Irish shillelagh. Did I say that right for you Irish people? And, and it's really a fascinating piece of equipment. But I doubt seriously, after it's been cut loose of its roots and shorn of its branches, uh, it turned into a rod of a or a cane, or some form of walking stick, that it has ever grown a leaf, ever. Uh, it probably has done the opposite. It's broken, or gotten brittle, or become uh, deformed, warped. Uh, wood does that. But 
I doubt if it grew a bud. God said, person who's important, theirs is going to bud. Next morning, of course, everyone in Israel wants to find out who's important. Isn't that something on the mind of every human being? Since this morning, some of you got up wondering who was important. <laughs> some of you got up hoping everyone else knew you were important. <laughs> Whoever got breakfast in bed, right? <laughs> well, they got up that morning, and obviously, you know already, Aaron's rod was going to be the one that had the bud. But no, there was more to it than that. It had also flowered, and it grown mature almonds. So to kind of understand what kind of stick his stick was made, what wood his stick was made of. He grew. Now, that's, that's all phenomenal unless you're an almond farmer, farmer and you know something more about the almond. Do you know an almond tree doesn't produce almonds overnight? Well, no tree really does, right? Nothing grows fruit quickly. It takes five years to grow an almond tree to start producing nuts. But the nut, to be edible, has to be on that tree for somewhere between 180 and 230 days. Now, I'm not an almond expert, but I looked that up. I thought, what is significant about almonds? I don't eat almonds. I, I have a, a food sensitivity. <laughs> if I get a Hershey bar with almonds, then I have to eat around the almond, which I do not have a chocolate sensitivity. I'm, <laughs> I'm still okay. But, uh, but I can't eat almonds, and I'm not sad about it. Don't, don't please, don't feel bad for me. It's okay. I, I, like I described, chocolate makes up the difference for me. So I'm not an almond expert. It's not something I, but I, I decided, why, what's this so significant? This is, this is a great miracle. This is actually bigger than me leaving, hoping to leave a dent in the water. This is, this is an unbelievable miracle. It went from being a stick, dead, to not just growing a couple leaves, but to grow some flowers and then to have almonds that you could literally eat. It was without a doubt a statement. God says, huh. This man's important. And by the way, if God says anything about somebody, it's true. For instance, he said Solomon was the wisest man there ever was. If someone ever asks you, who's the wisest man that ever was? Your best answer and the correct answer is Solomon. Now, you could put your name in the place and say, well, me. But you would be flat out lying. It would be like one of the leaders that Naphtali saying to all his tribe, I know Aaron's rod budded and grew flowers and has almonds, but I'm still important. <laughs> no, your rod is just a dead stick. You're not, you're not any more important than anybody else, God said. So God has said in, in number 17, Aaron is important. He has said Solomon is the wisest. He said David, the king, was a man after his own heart. Now, if I were to ask you, who is the man after God's own heart? You might say your own personal name. And I, that would be a wonderful statement for you to make. I'm not going to argue with that. But I got to tell you, God already said the man who did that the very best, the man who he wanted to highlight in relationship to that. In fact, it was so outstanding that he said, that's the very one that my own son, Jesus Christ, is going to be able to trace his lineage to. I want my son to be coming from that man. That man is so much like my heart that I'm going to let him be the father of my, the earthly father of my son, Jesus Christ. When God says something about somebody, it counts. So now I'm going to get you to my text. Turn to Psalm 32. I have set you up. I want you to know it's what God says that really counts and really means something. And God can back it up. If God needs to back it up, he can make almonds grow on a dead stick. He can, he can show you the wisdom of Solomon. He can show you the grandeur and the beauty of, of David's poetry in the book of Psalms. In fact, we're in Psalm 32. That's truly going to be on display there. Psalm 32 is a psalm by David. This is a lovely psalm. But inside of this great poetry. This is great poetry. Those who, who uh, understand poetry are going to have to say, this is truly fabulous poetry. I'm not really a true poet. Uh, I shared this in the 9, 930 service. Um, my style of poetry is closer to the roses or red 
violets are blue, you think this rhymes, but it doesn't style of poetry. That's, that's, that's as deep as I usually get into poetry. But I don't, I don't not, not being a poet doesn't mean that I don't understand that this is lovely and attractive wordsmithing. It's also more than that. It's the inspired word of God. But David, a man after God's own heart, it, God supports that. Says this guy when he wrote a poem, I had it written down in my Bible. When when this man David wrote a song, because he could sing these poems he wrote. When he wrote a song, that's getting recorded. That's I I want you to know something. The, David, a man after God's own heart. Solomon, the wisest man. Aaron, he's important. So now here's here's my message this morning. We're in Psalm thirty two. And we're going to deal with the first two verses. But I'm going to set you up with this question. Does God say you are happy? He said Aaron is important. Solomon is wise. David is a man after God's own heart. Are you happy by God's statement? Let's read what he says is a happy person. Verse number one, it begins with the word happy. You say, no, it doesn't. It's the word blessed. It's the same word, except for blessed is the plural of happy. Now, in English, we can't say happy, plural, so we put a word in front of it, very happy. You're not just happy, you're very. Or, or if so some of you say, well, I don't use the word very, I use the word extremely. Okay, <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you. We just don't know how to make happy with a letter S on the end of it, and it makes sense. So we add a word on the front end of it to help modify it so we know this is extremely happy. This is very happy. You're really happy. That's what the word blessed is. Really happy, very happy, extremely happy. Who is? Is he who? And then it's going to list off four things that have happened. Now, this is God telling us through David who is happy. My question, my message, my statement to you this morning is this. Are you happy because God says you're happy? Let's, let's consider, first of all, it says it's the person whose transgression is covered. I think we all understand a little bit about the idea of transgression. This is, this is a big, fancy 25-cent word for doing wrong. This is the kind of wrong that is deliberate, on purpose, with all your intent. I don't care what the law says. I'm doing it. I don't care what mom says. I'm doing it. I don't care what the authority says. I'm doing it. Consequences, pff, who cares? Problems with having done this, pff, I don't care. It's worth it. <laughs> Everything I've just said, you understand intimately in your own heart. Every last one of us has at least been presented with that temptation. And some of us, I use that carefully, some of us, have actually acted out upon that. We've been told by somebody who's got some more authority than we have not to do something or to do something. And out of the straight, dark recesses of our hearts. And there have been consequences. Even if you haven't been caught yet. You live in some kind of mortal fear that it is going to be discovered. It is going to be. Hey, here's one. The speed limit is. I don't care what that number is. I can handle it. My car's got good brakes. I, can, I know how to drive. I'm really qualified. I've been driving for I don't know how many years. And I'm, I haven't had a wreck. And I don't know. And insurance companies give me lowest rates. And, and phew, off you go. And, and you haven't been caught. But as I share with you that story, as some of you can relate to it, you recognize in the car are some occupants who know you've blown the law away. And some of you have unbelievably uh, been able to slow up at the right moment in time where then you finally passed the policeman and you said to yourself, or even out loud, Whew, that was close. <laughs> that was close. And you minded your P's and Q's for a little while, settled back down, pulled your foot out of the accelerator a little bit, got a hold of yourself till you got your transgression nerve back in place. Now, driving, you say, well, that's really none of your business. No, it's not. It's not my business. Please don't wreck. Um, but, but it is God's business. 
God's in charge of all authorities and governments. And, and I, as I preach to you, I want you to know I'm not preaching at you. I'm speaking to myself. If you think the message is kind of bordering on nebby nosing into your life, you should have heard it this morning at 4 o'clock when I had to, like, agree with the Lord. I treat Route 18 and 151 like my own driveway. I know where I am on this highway so well that I can shut my eyes and I know where I am. Now, I don't shut my eyes. <laughs> that much. <laughs> but we understand that transgression, even if we haven't been caught, is a thorn somewhere in the inner recesses of our heart bothering us. And you're driving along, going faster than you ought, thinking in your heart, you shouldn't be doing this. It's the end of the month. Shouldn't be doing this. Even if it's the beginning of the month. Or the middle of the month. Shouldn't be doing this. And, and Okay, so if I'm hard on driving the speed limit wrong, what about with telling lies? Oh, everyone knows I lie. No big deal. Now it's really a big deal. Telling lies. You know, some of us only open our mouth to tell the next one. Oh, it's just stretching the truth. Everyone knows I'm not. Just, just, just. And, and we justify, oh, it's a little white lie. You know, we, just a tiny little white. It's not that big of a deal. And, and, and yet deep in our heart, no matter how hard we try to paint it another color or change its impact, it's transgression. And by definition, there's a little bit of unhappiness hanging around your life. By the definition of what is right and what is wrong, there's some unhappiness eating away like cancer at the, the area of, that keeps you truly happy. I've just got started on listing sin. They, they said, if you want to be a popular preacher, just don't preach on sin. I said, tell people, you know, God's holy. And everyone said, yes, God's holy. Church is good. Church is good. Uh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Everyone go home. Yeah, I like that preacher. And then you start naming sins. Does God not name sins? Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. And, he, and, and it becomes a, a problem then because that, that's where we're bothered. When I go to the doctor, I just hate him. I, I like him. But they go in there and he tells me what's all wrong with me. I go to the dentist. He tells me what's all wrong with me. Uh, I don't like to hear. I, now it's my insurance agent. I've hit a certain threshold with my age. And now he's telling me what's wrong with me too. Yeah, it's, 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 it's getting old. <laughs> Bad pun. <laughs> we, we just start not liking these people. They, they become the major component of our social life. And we don't like them. Why? Because they're dealing in truth. They're dealing with the actual facts, and it's bothersome. The mirror. I hate the mirror. Some of you are starting to join my club. I hate the mirror. You look in there, and there's an old person that lives in my mirror now. That could be the name of my book I'm going to write about myself. There's an old person that lives in my mirror. He's got tons of problems. I can see him very clear. Almost sounds like a poem, doesn't it? <laughs> This, this, this is a problem, and, and, and so we do things to try to dodge the bullet, and, and, and uh, changing the hairstyle, and, and uh, putting on the paint, and wearing a, a nice tie. If I wear a really nice tie, maybe you won't see my face. This mask idea has some side benefits, doesn't it? <laughs> there's, some, there's, some, there's some actual benefits besides whatever the other medical issues might be. And, and, and as I talk about this, you must understand, God has to deal with us because this is where we are. And he says, I want you to know if you're in transgression, deliberate action, where you want to break the laws and you want to deny authority, their privileges, and I don't care what they are, whether it's telling lies or whether it's speeding or you put in your favorite sin you like to commit. God says, that's, that's the very reason you're unhappy. You might say, what's the reason I want to be happy? And God says, it's the very reason you're unhappy. 
It's the very reason you're. It, it goes. It goes. He says, in case in case that's not what you want want to think about, let's go to the next one. And in, in verse one, he says, "Whose sin is covered?" Do you know what sin is? Well, transgression is sin. That's true. But it's the big general word for anything that describes you didn't get to the place God wanted you to be. God has created every last one of us. His desire for your existence is to be something for him. But most of the time, we spend our lives trying to be something for us. That's not even really working very well. We often let ourselves down. Not even worried about what God wants. This next little story is from my personal life to illustrate this thought, but I want you to see, this is sin. I used to take piano lessons, and every year there was a recital. And at the recital, you were supposed to play the most difficult piece of piano that ever could be made for someone in your ability level. And I had taken piano for several years, and I was given this crazy little piece. It was difficult for me. And so the way I handled it was not to practice. Both my parents, and one of them is here this morning, she could uh, vouch for this, uh, told me, you better practice. You better practice. And I wouldn't. I said, my sister needs to practice. I'm being very kind to her. She can have the piano. I got other things I'm doing. I'm more interested in playing the trumpet. I don't want to play the piano. I had all these. And it came to the recital. And I was in the age group of the group that goes last. And normally that's also the better piano players. The best were saved for the end. The ones playing the most difficult pieces. At the end. I'm near the end. It was the end. <laughs> it was a disaster. I blew it. I, it was so bad I could feel people who didn't know me feeling bad for me. And people who knew me not only felt bad for me, they were torn between horror and anger. You could just see the seething of their anger combined with the horror of how awful that was. It was a disaster. At the end of the day, no one said, Oh, we're so proud of you. You are our best son. No one said, oh, would you please play the piano at my next wedding? <laughs> In fact, everyone tried to figure out how to sever the word piano from my own personal name. Because I had been such... Can I, can I use theology for you? I had sinned. I had never achieved what my teacher had said I could do. I had sinned against her. My parents, obviously, I'd sinned against them. The audience in that room, I had truly fouled their ears. I'd sinned against myself. But really, the one who was most violated at that recital was the one who actually created me. He had formed me and created in me some capability that, yes, there was... There had been some music ability in me. I had some uh, ability to accomplish something. I had been given equipment to do so and a, a fabulous teacher to help me through that. And, and I failed on every level. You say, well, it was just a dumb piano recital. And, you, know, you know what? We do that with all our sin, don't we? We let ourselves off. And you know, as I share you that story, there's nothing happy about it. My mom won't look at me right this moment. We shouldn't talk about some things. And as I say that, you're thinking the same thing about some of the places that you really dropped the ball. It's not a happy place, is it? It's not a good spot to be, is it? And if you and I know what it means to squirm in such a place. And as I say that, you're thinking, well, you didn't murder anybody. You didn't use any profanity. And you didn't break any of the other Ten Commandments. Well, I think probably honoring my father and mother was wiped off the face of the planet with, with my performance that time. But, but you're right. You said this isn't one of those lists you go, you go to prison over. You don't need a lawyer in this. But it doesn't matter. It's still sin. I had not achieved what God had set for me to achieve. And, and, and God even wants us to understand that even the plowing of the wicked is sin. For the very same reason I just shared with you my poor piano performance. Unhappy is the man who sins. 
the very next verse says, well, okay, if you haven't figured it out yet, let me, let me give you another word. In verse number two, uh, whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Oh, iniquity. Oh, this is a big, another one of those synonym words for sin. This is the kind of word God uses to let us know how we stink up heaven. I know that's not a Sunday morning phrase, stink up heaven, but we truly understand this morning as I drove in, there was a dead skunk in the middle of the road, speaking of poetry. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I made sure my uh, button on my uh, vehicle was on that uh, setting where you only are breathing cabin air. You don't let the outside air come in. I did not want my vehicle filled with iniquity. I did not need the odor of a dead skunk haunting my ride down the highway. I, I didn't want that. And there, as I saw that, I thought, boy, if, of all days for me to have a dead skunk, the day I want to talk about iniquity. God does not like the way we stink up heaven. He doesn't care for the fact that some get to use his name as a byword. And, and yes, we are hard on profanity around here. Uh, Jesus Christ is our Savior. He's not a curse word. In our country today, most people use his name as an expression. He's, he's, he's not amused. His, his ears and his heart are broken on hearing his name abused in such a fashion. I know there's other profane curse words out there, but I, I'm speaking of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the very essence of love, the, the one who gave everything he had up to live with us and then die for us. Recently, I've been reading about heroes, war heroes, uh, I've been had been focused on the Civil War, but I was given a book on on um, Winston Churchill for my birthday, and uh, I finished reading it. But as I read it, it, it it touched on some people who were heroic during the the darkest days of World War II, and and the the efforts that they went through on behalf of their country, on behalf of the cause of of their their side. Uh, the suffering and the intense anguish that they were subjected to. It, talked to, it told the story of a, a fellow who was a great fighter during World War I, a, an airplane fighter, uh, an ace. And uh, during the, the uh, days of World War I, he had lost both his legs. When World War II came, they were in such bad shape trying to find qualified fighters, they brought him back to fight again. Now, I, I don't know a whole lot about flying, but I do know when you're flying an airplane of the vintage of World War II and World War I, you not only need your hands and arms, you need your feet as part of the equipment to operate the, the, the um, airplane. And this guy answered the call of his country and flew in World War II with basically no legs. And as you, as you read that story, your, your heart is like overwhelmed with the sacrifice and his willing sacrifice again. And, and how in the world did he figure out how to keep an airplane in the air, let alone use it against the enemy as, an, as a fighter pilot? How, how did he do that? And you, and you, and, and you're, and you just you swell up in pride for him. You, you admire him. And you would never use his name as a curse word. Why, instead, this is a man who you salute. You honor this man. And yet we can drag Jesus Christ's name through the mud in our country. And yet his name can be just a byword. And I say his name, of course, we know people say, oh, my God, or uh, some corruption of that. As I, as I read about this, this is where we touch on iniquity. Now, all sin is iniquity. Every sin. My, my playing the piano that day, that was iniquity. 
Transgression is iniquity. But, but I want you to understand that the stench of our wickedness does hit heaven's nostrils. God is not amused. God is sickened. And he says, those who live that way, whose name, who use my name in, in, as a byword, as a afterthought, as an expression, these, these kinds of, these are not happy people. And though they think they're high, wide, and handsome, though they think they're running the world deep inside, there's no happinesses. They're not very happy. They understand more about misery. And then there's one more. And we come down, and if you read the last of verse number two, he says this. Uh, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Guiltiness. The closet full of skeletons. All these things that haunt. Whether you were caught or not. And then often it seems the, the not being caught make the bigger, louder, clanking skeletons. The ones that haven't yet been discovered, boy, do they run their crickety old fingers up and down the interior of the heart. Remember me. Remember this. Remember me. Remember this. Remember me. Remember that. Man is fascinated by the concept of guilt. Hollywood has made movies about guilt. Great literature uh, has been written about guilt. We know in our country the, the famous story, The Scarlet Letter. It's all about guilt. Uh, we know how it eats and rots and seeds and brings commotion. You might be sitting in a quiet place all by yourself, but your whole life is just a turmoil of guilt, overwhelmed with anything but happiness. Why, the very first time this concept hit mankind, there were just two of us, and we were in a perfect place called the Garden of Eden, and it struck us so badly that we went and hid and covered ourselves with fig leaves. And that's been the story of us ever since, hiding and covering ourselves with fig leaves. And does it work? No, because when God says, where are you? You have to say, I'm hiding and he says, why? Because I am afraid. Not because I'm happy. But as you read these two verses, he starts off with the word happy. How can he take happy and stick it with these four words, transgression and sin and iniquity and guilt? How can he put happy with that? Because he says, the one who gets it covered is happy. The argument isn't on the fact that there's some who don't have it. That's, that's, <laughs> that's never going to happen because we all have these problems. Every last one of them, whether you're in this building or you're on a live stream presently or a live stream in the future, which would be, a, 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 I guess, a, a, a premiere at that moment in time. Regardless of what it is you're listening to this, these two verses read, all of us, Understand those four words, transgression and sin and iniquity and guilt. What a lot of people don't understand is them being covered. God says the one who does understand that, that's the guy who's happy. Now, I want you to know in all this wording that you've seen here, this all is found in one word that we preach regularly at this church. This is all about being saved. Saved. Can I say it then this way? The happy man is the saved man. Oh, he might look at the past, some event in his life, some story of his past in which he did so poorly. He transgressed. He sinned. He was filled with iniquity, and his actions were iniquitous. His guilt was terrible. But there was a day in which an amazing thing happened. It got covered up. It got totally 
And I know it's poor English, but it captures it best of all. It got disappeared. <laughs> it got disappeared. One of the songs that we sing, and we start teaching it to our young ones at a very early age around here. And during the pandemic, we've been on kind of like a, a weird schedule. It hasn't been taught in the last several months. But it's a short little song that goes, gone, 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 gone. Four times. Gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. There's something unbelievably joyful about having your sins gone. Let me finish that song. Gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Now my soul is free. And in my heart's a song. Then it explains in this song what really God does to our sins. He says they're buried in the deepest sea. That's an actual quote from scripture. Buried in the deepest sea. They tell me man has not yet found the bottom of the ocean. I'm so glad. You know why? That's where God said he put my sin. Now, we've been awfully deep. We've got technology that can go way down. I've heard recently we're down six miles, miles somehow deep in the ocean out in the Pacific somewhere. But my sins are deeper than that. Buried in the deepest sea, yes, that's good enough for me. The man who knows his sin, his transgression, his iniquity, his guilt is gone like that. That's a happy man. That's a man who is free. That's a man whose soul can sing. That's a man who can look life in the eye, people in the eye. Uh, the preacher, as you go out the door, in the eye. <laughs> That's the man who can look at his boss and say, yes, sir, I did the best job I could. Here's the results. Here's a person that can look at his mate, his wife, or his husband, her husband and say, yes, I've been true and faithful to you. This is a person who can look God in the eye and say, I've not used your name in vain. It's a person that can look at the policeman and say, yes, sir. Speed limit's 35 miles an hour, sir. <laughs> Says so in my speedometer. <laughs> yes, sir. There's, there's something connected to happiness and a man who knows whatever he's done that was wrong is by God's word gone. Now, I'm not talking this question. I'm not asking you if you think you're happy. I'm asking you if you know God knows you're happy. God says if any of us are treasuring sin in our lives, if there's any blackness of sin lurking in our lives, if there's anything that we're doing or that we've done that he hasn't been able to forgive, whatever that is, we are not a, we're not a happy person. We may try to cover it up. We may pray, try to pretend. There are some people who, who have decided drinking's a good way to drown out their sorrows. Some have decided drugs is a great way to go on a trip and escape. And some have gotten involved in pleasure and some in sports and some in hobbies. But when you get down to the bottom of it and you can't do that stuff anymore, what makes you happy? Man doesn't have the capacity to make himself happy. Only God's forgiveness of our sin will bring happiness. I have seven or six more points. Next week, we have a special speaker. But Lord willing, continuing on from there, I'll go over six more ways. God says from his word that make a man happy. But the first place and the most important place to begin is by being saved. The saved man is the happy man. Instead of me asking you, does God know if you're happy? Let me ask you this way. Are you saved? Heavenly Father, as we read these two verses about the happy man, the man who's, who's 
transgression and sin and iniquity and guilt is covered, gone, has been disappeared. Lord, as we read about this man, it requires us then to ask ourselves the very question, am I that man? Am I that man? Well, Father, I'm the messenger here this morning. I simply read these verses and kind of hunched out some thoughts, highlighted with some definitions and told a couple stories. I spoke to the thought that it's really what you say that counts, not what we think or, or another man's opinion. It's what God says that counts. Lord, we thank you for your word and that it is truth and that it deals with us honestly, kindly, but honestly. Father, as we bring our service to a close, it might be that there's someone in this room who has wanted happiness, who's striven hard in, in their career, in their family, in their hobbies. There's some, Lord, have just started off in life, don't, not sure totally where they're going. They may be so young that they haven't even gotten out of school, and yet they understand the need to be happy. There's a hunger in the human heart for, for to be happy. And yet we discover very early that Life is full of troubles and bitters, bitterness and, and difficulty and aggravations, anything but happy. As we get older, it just seems to fester and grow worse. And yet the Bible speaks to us and says, wait, wait. If you get your sin covered, if you let me take your guilt, if you let me forgive you, if you let me save you from your sin, you can be happy. It's amazing, Lord, how it sounds so simple, and it is, and yet we make it so hard. So work in the hearts of those either on the live stream or these in the building today, that they may understand from Scripture the happy person. And then they look in the mirror, they can say, I am that person. Oh, my sin is gone. Father, may somebody or several somebodies hearing the sound of my voice recognize that this message was for them. Their heads bowed and eyes shut. In a moment here, we're going to stand and sing a hymn. It's a closing hymn. It's an invitation hymn, too. If you'd like to talk with me a little bit more about this, as, as we would sing, I would invite you here to the front. I would ask you to go down the outside aisle and uh, there wait for me. You might have to get going, though. You might have... Uh, appointments, responsibilities, you're uh, needing someone else to drive you. It might be a spot like that. So in your need of the hour to get out of here quickly, instead of being able to come forward and talk briefly with me, you can make this matter right where you sit, or if you're at home, right there in your living room, dining room, family room, wherever it is, you can make this an issue at this very moment without talking more to me. You can simply say, that's me, Lord. I'm not the happy person. I don't know if my sin is gone. I'm not. I'm, my transgression is over my head. My iniquity stinks to high heaven. I'm guilty. But could you forgive me? Would you please forgive me of this and save me? Oh, that's a good Bible word. And God understands it. You don't have to do anything more than that. You can simply ask him to forgive you of your sin. I mean, aren't you tired of being miserable? Aren't you tired of not being happy? Oh, God says, I, I want you to be happy. You don't need to be miserable. You don't need to have this hanging on your head, wearing you out, worrying you. You can get this made right. The Bible's full of stories of men who, who were just like this. Murderers, thieves, liars, drunks. Cheats, profane, and they got saved. What a difference. Oh, if you could just pray right where you are, whether at home on a live stream or here in the building, Lord, save me. Oh, save me. And Heavenly Father, as we now come to this song, we ask We ask that you do a great work 
in a heart of somebody who has needed this message. In Jesus' name. And would you please stand? We're going to sing hymn number 250. Someday you'll hear God's final call to you. Someday you'll hear God's final call to you. Father, I will not prolong the invitation. Time is fleeting. And yet, as you've tarried with grace and mercy, even after people leave, they can get this. Lord, this is not just required in this service. Even as they drive home, Lord, as they drive by a speed limit sign, may they be reminded they can get forgiveness. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, God only wise be honor and glory forever and ever. And all of God's people say, amen. Good afternoon and God bless you.